Welcome back. So we're talking about neural networks, which are very expressive machine learning architectures uh, for arbitrary function approximation. And we're talking about the architecture, kind of how they work, what the different types are. And what I want to talk about now is why they are having this huge resurgence. Why are neural networks everywhere now when before 2012, they weren't even mentioned in the top, top 10 algorithms, for example. Uh, so, so something big happened in 2012 that put neural networks back on the map. And I'm going to walk you through kind of what that was uh, and what the new capabilities are and where these are going. Okay? So we've known for a long time, or at least hypothesized for a long time, and this goes back to the neuroscience, that if you had deeper, uh, bigger neural networks, like our brain has a ton of neurons and many, many, many layers of connections, maybe you could get more expressive, better uh, neural networks. And back in the olden days, we didn't have enough data and big enough computational architectures and good enough algorithms uh, to train these kind of deep, big neural networks. And so that's really what changed in 2012 with this ImageNet uh, data set um, that I'm going to tell you about. So what you want to do is train this big, deep neural network, but you need there's a lot of degrees of freedom. There's a lot of free numbers, free parameters you have to tune. And so you need a lot of training data uh, to fit those models. In addition, if I want to be able to reliably know what is a dog and how is that different than a cat and how is that different than a pickup truck, I need a lot of examples of all of those, labeled data. And this was very uh, expensive labeled data set in 2012, this ImageNet data set with millions of labeled images. So you might have a thousands, thousands of images of a dog that are labeled dog and thousands of images of cats and trucks and cars and broccoli and everything you can imagine, everything you've seen practically is in this ImageNet database, labeled images. And that in combination with increasingly powerful computational algorithms, so kind of GPU uh, graphics processing unit computers that could do uh, very, very massively parallel computations on multiple cores, allowed us both the computational hardware, the architecture, the labeled data to start training these deep, more expressive networks. And so that was kind of the birth or the rebirth of deep learning. And since then, it's taken over uh, many, many, many aspects of our uh, machine learning in, in, in our daily lives, from Alexa and Siri to image classification in, in Google and Facebook uh, to much broader reaching applications. Uh, and I'll also point out that um, there is a huge development of open source software. So the industrial investment by big tech companies, uh, billions of dollars of research and, and development of open source software and kind of community driven research and software has really uh, also contributed to driving this. So you have your big label data, unprecedented volumes of quality data, massive and increasing uh, architectures for processing uh, this data and training these algorithms, which facilitate deep, deeper, larger uh, architectures. And the software is getting much better to, uh, to, to train this all. So in the, in the olden days, you'd have to program the framework to train these algorithms. And now with TensorFlow and PyTorch and Keras, it's much, much easier to do this with, with your data, with new data. Okay? And so this is ubiquitous. It's everywhere uh, in facial recognition, surveillance, uh, image, Captioning, this is kind of incredible. You can actually label images now. This was, um, you know, even a decade ago, we thought this might be impossible. This is something only humans can do, but that's not true now. Um, you, can, you can image caption. Not always perfect. Uh, you know, this is a cat sitting on a couch with a remote control. Not really. This was one of my favorites, a horse standing in the middle of a road. Where's the horse? Um, but, but still pretty good. Um, of course, you know, images are not trivial. They're still uh, canonical things that machines get confused about. I love the you know, chihuahua blueberry muffin. It's easy for us to tell, or is it? Um, fried chicken dog is fun. But overall, uh, the performance is getting you know, at or above human level recognition in a vast ar array of, of tasks, especially in, in image recognition, uh, natural language processing, speech recognition, things like that. Um, 
this is pretty cool. This was pretty recent where a set of researchers are using these generative networks, these GANs, to start doing um, you know, generative models. So from one picture of the Mona Lisa, they were able to make these very realistic, lifelike uh, sequences that look like she's speaking and interacting in the real world. Um, so these generative models, you might have seen them if you put a picture, uh, you know, there's websites you can upload a picture and it'll make it look like Van Gogh painted it. That's this kind of technology. But the implications are pretty profound. I mean, this is going to change perhaps, you know, our society at the core. If you, what if you um, can't trust the news you're seeing? because people can generate videos that look just as real uh, as the real world. What if you can't trust what your politicians are saying? Maybe you couldn't trust what your politicians were saying already, but what if you don't even know if it was them saying it? I mean, this changes a lot. So there's a bunch of really exciting applications. Maybe I can generate new, uh, new airfoil designs or new automotive designs or, or new engineering designs in general that I've never seen before. Uh, that, there's really cool applications of that. But there's also serious uh, kind of concerns that, that we should be thinking about in these generative models. So again, neural networks um, in general can be very expressive, but you need lots of training data to, you know, in general to train them. That is computationally expensive. So we have these GPU uh, and actually new tensor processing unit, TPU architectures, uh, lots of open source software. And so it's kind of this culmination of, of uh, industrial you know, tech investment, big label data sets, uh, and improving computational hardware that's really driving these incredible uh, advances. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about kind of caveats. I really should, there's a cautionary tale about when you can use neural networks, when you should use neural networks, uh, if this isn't a cautionary tale enough. Okay, thank you.